Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Tax in 10 with me, Rachel D'Souza and Andrew Robbins. We are both tax partners in RSM's London office and have a wealth of experience in dealing with a wide range of private client matters. Your feedback is valuable to us, so do keep it coming, especially if you have thoughts on any topics you would like us to cover. Now, for various reasons, domicile is suddenly a really hot topic at the moment. We've had everything from legal cases about South African billionaires through Labour raising the prospect of big tax changes to the rights and wrongs of Rishi Sunak's wife's tax affairs. So we thought it would be a good time to stand back from all the noise and remind ourselves about the basics of domicile and tax. So let's start with the most basic question of all and ask ourselves, what does domicile actually mean? And I think it's actually worth thinking here about the difference between what we mean by domicile and what we mean by residence. So residence is the country you're living in at a particular time. So Rachel and I are both UK resident. In simple terms, you know, we spent more than 183 days here in the tax year. There are different rules, doesn't matter. This is where we live. But domicile is the country you think of as your permanent home. Now, unlike residence, it's only possible to have one domicile at any time. And it's perfectly possible to live in one country, but to be domiciled in another. If you're only in the other country for what's called a temporary or fixed period. That's right. But of course, this is where the definition begins to get a bit slippery, isn't it? I might claim that I consider Australia to be my permanent home and that I intend to retire there. But does that mean I am Australian domiciled, even though I've never set foot in Australia? Come on, not surprisingly, it doesn't. To be domiciled in a country, you must have a real connection to it, either by actually living there, domicile of choice, or by birth, normally called the domicile of origin. You'll be pleased to hear that we're not going to bore you with all the details about the different types of domicile that exist. But I do want to make the point that domicile of origin can be really quite sticky. So the, the easiest way to explain this is if I give you an example. Let's say my grandfather was domiciled in France. That means that my father is quite likely to have a French domicile himself, even if he lived his whole life in the UK provided that my father genuinely considered himself to be French. And let's say he planned to retire there. So in theory, I could then have a French domicile of origin as well because of that family history going back two generations. Now, because it takes a lot to change your domicile, a lot of second, second generation Brits will actually find themselves in that situation. And that's a really sort of important point to remember. Now, that's big picture what domicile means. But Rachel, why do we care? Yeah, indeed. So in simple terms, the UK aims to tax long term residents on their global wealth and short term residents only on UK income and gains or foreign wealth that they actually bring here. And we do this by the special rules that we have for the non-DOMs. Now, in most cases, anyone who has been UK tax resident for more than 15 out of the last 20 years will be taxed on their worldwide income and gains, just like you and me. Non-DOMs who have been in the UK for less than 15 years can choose to be taxed on the remittance basis, which means tax on UK income and gains but foreign income and gains are only taxed if they bring them to the UK. OK, so again, let's think about an example. If I've got a, a German national who comes to live in the UK, she can bring the fortune she made into Ger in Germany tax free into the UK to the extent that it arose before she got here. But any wealth that is generated outside of the UK while she's living here. If she claims 
to be taxed on the remittance basis and brings that that money that she's created while living in the UK and she brings it to the UK, that's when she'll be taxed on it in the UK. That's right. And remember, once you've been resident for more than seven years, you need to pay an annual fee to qualify for the remittance basis. And once you've been resident for 15 years, the treatment ceases to be available. And any income and gains covered by the remittance basis will be taxed if you re remit them later, even if it's after that 15 year period is up. And I think that's a really important point because people do get confused about that. Um, you can't avoid the remittance basis just by stopping claiming it and then bringing the money in later. Yeah. It's also worth remembering that inheritance tax rules work differently because in general the tax is only payable on your death. So the general principle is the same, which is that if a non-dom dies when UK resident, then the UK will only tax their UK assets. But once you've lived here for more than 15 years, then all of your worldwide assets are taxable on your death. Yeah, and I think we also briefly just want to talk about offshore trusts. So basically, the UK has rules that mean if a non-dom puts money into an offshore trust, the trust sort of acts like the, the non-dom himself even though um, that person, the individual, has become deemed domiciled. And what I mean by that is that the foreign income and gains within the trust can continue to roll up tax-free and foreign assets remain exempt from IHT even after the domicile status changes after that 15 year period that we've spoken about. Provided you don't then add any other assets into that trust. Yeah, yeah. offshore trust is a whole conditions. subject of its own, but it is a really important advantage for, for non-DOMs. Yeah, true. Um, so that's a, a really quick race through the domicile rules. The question of whether or not these are fair or logical is something we could talk about for a long time. Um, but I will say that for me, the rules they do kind of make sense purely from a pragmatic point of view because the UK has to strike a balance between encouraging people to come here and then taxing them while they are here and it may not be perfect but I think that the non-dom system actually does that pretty reasonably. Um, you could definitely argue that it's not fair that non-doms get taxed more favourably than the rest of us but the fact is these are people who in most cases would find it very easy to go somewhere else and I'd rather have them in the UK creating wealth and paying some tax than not being here at all. That, that's all well and good but there is a lot of political pressure being imposed by Labour and the last time that happened the Conservatives responded by making big changes to the domicile rules which actually narrowed its scope quite considerably actually. So whatever you think about it, it wouldn't be completely surprising to see a government of either colour changing the rules again. Of course, the difference now to say 10 years ago is that many, many more countries offer a tax privileged way in for those who relocate. So it really is a question of getting the balance right. Yeah, I I have to agree with that. Um, on which note, do you have a recommendation? Funny you should ask that, because I do this week. Um, and it's especially for those of us who might like a bit of 1980s nostalgia. Um, well, actually, although this is both the good and the ugly side of the 1980s. Um, it's a series called It's a Sin. It's by Russell T Davis. Um, it was originally aired on Channel 4 and it's still available on the streaming part of Channel 4, but I noticed it's available on various other streaming platforms. The programme really, really invokes what it was like living as a young adult during the 1980s. And as I say, it's not quite for the faint hearted because it's it's really hard hitting on how homophobic society was then. It did make me cry, so be warned. But 
it is really, really well worth watching. So that's my recommendation for the week. So when I want to be taken back and to have a sob, I know where to go. Absolutely. Thank you all for listening. Um, please do let us have your feedbacks and comment. And as ever, we can be contacted on andrew.robbins at rsmuk.com or rachel.dsouza at rsmuk.com. You think you'd know it by now, Andrew. You do, but it's yours that I can't pronounce. <laughs> See you <laughs> next everyone. time. Bye.